But I have four kids kidnapped and murdered right in the middle of the 70s in this county. Uh, it was just a, it was surreal. On February 15, 1976, Mark Stebbins was walking home from uh, the American Legion at Livernois and Nine Mile, where his mother worked. He headed home and never made it. During a 13-month period in Oakland County, Michigan, in the second part of the 70s, a serial killer dubbed the Oakland County Child Killer or the Babysitter Killer was roaming free and committing gruesome crimes against children. The Oakland County child killings happened between February 15th, 1976 to March 16th, 1977. Once again, this was a 13 month period. Four children, two boys and two girls, aged between 10 to 12, were abducted and eventually killed by an unidentified killer. They all went missing outside their homes or while they were on their way to or from another location in Oakland County, Michigan. The children's bodies were individually discovered in a public area within 19 days from the day they disappeared. The children were all either strangled or shot and the two boys were discovered to have been sexually abused. There were at least two other murder cases that may have been connected. The largest murder investigation in the U.S. history at that time was launched. Leads came and went, but no one was ever arrested. Mark Stebbins was a seventh grader at the Lincoln Junior High School. He was 12 years old and 4 feet and 8 inches in height and weighed about a hundred pounds. He had strawberry blonde hair that would have likely been covered by the hood of his parka. Mark apparently called his mother around 1.30 p.m. on the 15th of February, 1976, to let her know that he was leaving the American Legion Hall and was headed home, but he never did. His body was found four days later, laying on a pile of food and dirt in the parking lot of an office building in Southfield. There were also two wounds to the left rear of his head. The autopsy showed the cause of that was asphyxia, by the way of smothering. There were also rope burns on his neck, wrists, and ankles, indicating that he was bound while being held in captivity. Upon further investigations, it was discovered that he was sexually abused with a foreign object. Mark's body was washed by the autopsy team, and with that, the potential fingerprints were also unintentionally washed. The second victim was Jill Robinson. She was also 12 years of age. She left her home on the 22nd of December, 1976, following an argument with her mother over dinner preparations. According to Carol, Jill's mother, they had an argument about biscuits. Carol asked her daughter to help her and make the biscuits for dinner, but Jill refused. Carol lost her cool and told Jill to leave until she became a part of the family. Jill left with a denim backpack which contained some of her clothes and a plaid blanket. Jill's parents were separated and they thought Jill just went to her father's house. Thomas Robinson reported his daughter missing at 11.30 p.m. when she did not arrive. There were two instances when Jill was seen. One was by a family friend at a hobby shop on Woodward Avenue near her mother's home. The other was when there were two witnesses who said that they saw her in Donut Depot on Maple Road. Her bicycle was found at a local hobby store the next day. Four days later, her body was found alongside the interstate of 75 in Troy within the view of the police station on the morning of December 26th. Jill's body was found laying on her back, fully clothed, no sign of rope burns, but there was a ring of deep dark red on her head. 
she had been shot in the face with a 12 gauge shotgun. Her body was fully clothed and wearing the same backpack she had taken with her when she left home. And upon autopsy, it seemed like she had been fed and kept for three days before her death. The third victim was Christine Mihalic. She was 10 years of age and was the youngest one out of the victims. She was a fifth grader at Patton Hill Elementary School. She was described as shy and quiet with few close friends. She went missing on the 2nd of January, 1977, after she didn't return home from a 7-Eleven store on 12 Mile Road at Oakshire. Shortly after Christine's disappearance, another kid from the same elementary school she attended went missing. This set off a panic at the school and the community. A frantic search went on for about 20 minutes and the child was eventually found at the school grounds. At that point, the tensions were at an all-time high. Parents were lining up outside the schools to pick their children up. 19 days later, on the 21st of January, a local mailman named Jerry Wanzi was driving when he saw a blue jacket in the snow. I saw a hand and it scared the hell out of me, Jerry said. Christie's body was found in a snowbank at the Dead End Street in Franklin Village. She was on her back with her knees drawn up. She was also in the same clothes she was last seen in. Her body was apparently frozen and the police had to wait for it to thaw and conduct an autopsy later. For that was true suffocation, and the police stated that there was no other sign of violence. The fourth and the last of the confirmed victims was Timothy King. He was 11 years old and he left home on the 16th of March after borrowing 13 cents from his sister Catherine to buy some candies at the corner store. It apparently wasn't a rare occasion for Timothy to make the three-block trip to the corner store for some candies. He left their house, brought his skateboard with him, and a football. And he headed toward the Hunter Maple Pharmacy. A store clerk, Amy Walters, remembered selling some candies to Timothy. He apparently left through the back door of the store into a dark parking lot around 8.30 p.m. The police stated that whatever happened to Tim happened between the time he left the store and before he got home. Around 9 o'clock p.m. on the same day, Timothy's parents got back to the house, but there was no sign of Tim. Tim's family started calling Tim's friends and searched around the nearby areas. The task force was alerted to another missing boy the following day. That same day, door-to-door searches were conducted and classmates were questioned. At this point, the hysteria was already at the all-time high. Although the time wasn't confirmed if he had been taken by the Oakland County killer, the police knew that if he was, then Tim might have been alive if they found him at that time because the killer often kept his victims alive for several days before killing them. Another witness came forward. It was a woman who told the authorities that she had seen a boy with a skateboard, much like Tim, talking to a man in the parking lot of the store he visited on the 16th of March, 1977. The man was seen talking to Tim was described as a white male with the long, shaggy hair and sideburns. Investigators then created a suspect profile based on witnesses' description of the man, a white male aged between 25 and 35, with a dark complexion, shaggy hair, and sideburns, who had a job that gave him freedom of movement and made him appear trustworthy to children, was familiar with the area and could keep children captive for long periods of time without rousing any neighbor's suspicions. A drawing of the suspected kidnapper and his blue AMC gremlin was released, and authorities started to question every gremlin owner in Oakland County. The police soon started a police operation wherein they searched people's car trunks. It was stated that if they found anything else like drugs or a firearm inside the cars, they still wouldn't make any arrests. They would just want to have Tim back alive. No motorists refuse to let the police search their cars, but even then, neither Tim 
where his abductor were located. While Tim was missing, Mrs. King, Tim's mother, wrote an open letter to the killer on the front page of the newspaper. His parents even addressed the killer and their son through a news show. They said that when Tim comes home, they would serve him his favorite meal, which is Kentucky Fried Chicken. Seven days after Tim's disappearance, two teenagers spotted a body in a shallow ditch as they were driving. It was Tim's body, and it was placed just across the county line in Wayne County. His skateboard was neatly placed next to his body. His clothing has been neatly pressed and washed, and just like other victims, his body has been washed as well, and fingers and toes were manicured, cleaning out any evidence under his nails. Tim was apparently still warm when they found his body. They tried to revive him at the scene, but it was too late to save the child. There were different versions of the story, but there was supposedly a chicken bone or another funeral card from one of the past victims that was found in Tim's pocket. During the autopsy, the officials found out that Tim's last meal had been Kentucky Fried Chicken. To listen to the full conversation regarding the Oakland County child killer, please visit our podcast YouTube channel, or you can find this podcast on any of your favorite podcast websites.